what a beautiful day it is to be in the house of the Lord. And again, any day, any uh, great day to be in the house of the Lord, when we can gather and worship Him in unity, in sincerity and truth. I'm going to move this back a little bit. I don't want things to work. But we're at that time of the year again, where we focus on the nativity. We look at Mary, we look at Joseph, we look at and focus on the babe born in the manger. And as we do every Christmas season, once again, we're looking at the nativity. But this year, we're looking at it in depth, what I call Christmas Story Investigators. We're taking a more in-depth look at who was Mary, who was Joseph, and etc. As we saw last week, we did a study on Mary. We looked at what her name meant. We meant it, looked at her lineage. We looked at what nationality she was. She was a Jew. She was from Nazareth. She was born approximately 36 to 48 A.D. That's the death. I apologize. She was born approximately 20 BC. Then she died approximately around 36 to 48 AD. We saw through um, our journey tracing, for lack of a better term, who was responsible for her, that she ended up and more than likely died in Ephesus. We saw that through tra tracing the life of John the Beloved. We saw who she was married to, which I'm sure came as a shocker to everybody, that she was married to a man named Joseph. We looked at her age status. We looked at her, the age of what she was probably betrothed at. When we look and compare Jesus' two parents, we find that she is the most prominent. Why? A, she was the vessel that God chose to give birth to the Messiah. So, of course, greater emphasis is going to be given there than on Joseph. Also, when we look at Jesus' earthly ministry, more than likely Joseph wasn't on the scene at the time. And with all the common knowledge aside, we find that there are several lessons that we can learn from Mary. And we're going to continue here today picking up where we left off with lessons from, learned from Mary. The first lesson we learned last night was last night, last week was submit to God regardless of the consequences. What would have happened to Mary if people would have found out that she was pregnant out of wedlock? Stone. She would have been stoned. <clears throat> but yet before the event, she even said, Lord, be it according to your will. Despite knowing the consequences that could come her way, she submitted to God regardless and she submitted knowing that her life was on the line. And when we look at her and just the aspect of pregnancy, it wasn't just a matter of making a decision, all right, once and done, and if no one finds out today, we're good. It went on for months. So she took her life, she placed her life in God's hands every single day for months at a time. Because if one person would have found out and reported her, she would have been killed. When we look at Mary's life, submission is not always easy, but it is always necessary. What does Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39 say? Matthew 26, 39, and then someone else would please find Luke 22, 42. Luke 22, 42. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my God, it be possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Here we find the Son of God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you think he knew what was going to happen? He was very much aware that he was about to be led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he cries out on three different occasions this night, Lord, if it be not my will, but thy will be done. 
and he sweat great drops of tears. This is this condition is possible when a person is under a lot of stress. Their blood vessels can break, and then that blood bleeds into the um, sweat glands, and then it sweats out. Jesus was on under immense strength, stress that night. He knew what was going to happen according to God's will. But three times he went before the Father and said, Not my will, but thy be done. But if you can, take this cup from me. Submission is not always easy. But it is always necessary. What would have happened if Jesus Christ never went to the cross? What would have happened if he never paid the, sac the sin sacrifice, paid the sin price for us? Submission is not always easy, but it is always necessary. What about Luke 22, 42? Read 
Luke 24, 49, if you go ahead and have that read or that, please. I always send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you endure the power of God on high. So Jesus gives the commands to the disciples to go and tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes, until the Comforter comes, however you want to phrase it or word it. And who's there in the upper room? Acts 1, verse 14. Mary was in the upper room, which means that she was what in relation to Jesus at this point? She was a follower. She was a disciple. So she was his mother, but she was also his disciple, one being taught by him, a student. And we find her in her motherly role at the wedding at Canaan there for family members because he said she told him that whatever he said to do it. And she says, woman, do you not know that it's not my time yet? So we see a little bit of a conflict, but she knew and learned what her role was. She knew that she was his mother, but she also knew that she had to be a disciple as well. So, so you're saying that Jesus knew more about God than Mary did. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that wholeheartedly because he was 100% God. But there was a point in his life when he had to be taught things as well. There was a point where she played the role of a mother. But there was also a point where she learned, played the role of a student. Did she well. teach him about, I mean, he was God. But did she teach him about God? Or you're saying, I'm sure I mean, they try to bring him up uh, like, like our parents did? I'm sure they brought us up like our parents did. But you got to keep in mind, they were a very religious people. Why did he get lost in the synagogue at the age of 10, uh, 12 in Jerusalem? Because they were performing their religious duties of going to Jerusalem to the temple every year. So Mary didn't know that he was God. Mary knew he was God from the very beginning. She did. Because the Holy Ghost came upon her. Upon the angel her. revealed it to her. But what I'm getting at is she knew what role to play and what. Brother Dennis, you own a garage. You're in charge of it. But you can't come forcing your way into the church and telling the pastor that you need to run it this way, you need to do this, you need to do that. You come and you learn as everybody else, we sit under the pastor, we hear the preaching and teaching. Other people are heads of households. That doesn't mean we come barking into the church and tell the pastor this is the way we need to do things, yada, yada, yada. We need to understand our role. When we come to the church, there's the pastor, there's the council, there's the church people. All right, if you want to get more specific, Sunday school uh, teachers, so forth and so forth. The point is, we all play different roles at different times. Right now, I'm the adult Sunday school teacher. Here in about a half an hour, I'm a son. If something would happen, unfortunately, I'm a son. I know what role to play and when. We all play different roles and at different times. And it's important to know which role we're playing at that time, which role we're in. Bible also talks about knowing who you are in Christ. Knowing which role you are to play in the church. Because not everybody can be the head. Not everybody can be the right hand. Not everybody can be the foot. If the left foot tries to be the head when the body walks, what happens? It's going to fall into space. We need to know what role we're in and when. But they all Absolutely. But we have to keep in mind, A, his parents taught him earthly things. I'm sure they tried to teach him some spiritual things because, once again, he was a Jew. They went to the temple. This is a ceremonial law. This is the claim that we have to take. Or in their case, um, two turtle doves. This is why we offer it up. But there comes a point he where... He did all his father. He did too because we know that the, uh, Jesus Christ was given the Holy Ghost without measure. And who's the one that guides us into all truth? The Holy Ghost. But Mary knew what role to play and when. And as Christians, we need to take that to heart and learn what role we need to play and when. Next thing I find is that she meditated on the things of God, or she thought about spiritual things. If someone would please read Luke chapter 2, verse 19. 
Luke 2, 19. And someone else find Luke 2, but also read verses 49 and 50. 49 and 50. Unless the same person just wants to read everything, that's fine. But we have Luke chapter 2, verse 19, and then 49 and 50. But Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And does someone have 49 and 50? If you go a little bit farther, does it say she pondered these things in her heart? Kept all these things in her heart, yeah. She kept all these things in her heart. So she pondered on these thought, things. Uh, if she pondered, what did she do? She thought. She meditated upon them. What did you read in verse 49 and 50, Mom? She didn't understand them. You know, as Christians, we need to meditate upon the Word of God. We need to think about it. We need to get it to the point that it's incorporated within us. And even if we don't understand it, we need to meditate upon it. We need to think about it. We need to question it. God, what does this mean? And reveal it to me. We need to find ourselves a place of prayer until the Holy Ghost makes it real to us. God instructs the Christian to meditate upon his Word. Would someone please read Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2? Psalm 1, 2. And we'll go to someone else, Philippians 4, 8. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And what's the law of the Lord? The word of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Can we relate that word meditate to ponder? To think about, to wonder what it means, to think on these things. What about Philippians 4 and verse 8? Christ. 
And we, become, and we do that by meditating on the Word of God, by taking it in prayer and allowing the Holy Ghost to change us. The next thing I see with Mary is she had faith. And as Christians, we must have faith. What is the enemy of faith? Doubt. Did Mary doubt the word of the Lord when it came to her? No. She said, be it unto me according to thy will. You know, God, if this is what you have me do, I'll do it. And I'll have faith that your will is going to be performed, be performed through this action. That your will be, will be brought to pass. And when we look at us as Christians, we must have faith. What does Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 state? Hebrews 11, 6. Yeah, I get stuck on stuff like that. Or 
one word in the verse that I don't understand, I don't know the definition. Well, then I don't get the whole verse. You know, the whole verse don't make sense. True. So you're saying take that verse and, and pray about it and ask God to reveal it to you. Absolutely. Okay, I got you. Absolutely. The next thing I find is that <clears throat> Mary was humble. What does we what do we find in Luke chapter one and verse forty eight? Luke one forty eight. <laughs> How did Mary refer to herself as? Before that, what role did she put class by herself? A handmaid. Is the handmaid in the head? Is she in charge? She's the one that does the work. She is the one that does the dirty work. They're low. In some countries, they might even be considered um, untouchables. They're unclean. But she said, Lord, let me be low. Let me be low that you may be lifted up. As Christians, we must realize that we are nothing without God. Without God, we are truly nothing. We are a heap of dirt. We are a heap of dust. From dust we come, and to dust we go. The only reason that there is any value to this vessel is because God breathed life into us. Otherwise, we are no significance. We are earthly. We are lowly. But we must realize that without God, we are nothing. Our whole dependency is upon Him. Everything we have is because of God. He's given it to us. Even Jesus Christ realized that it's all about God, about Him being magnified. In John chapter 17, we have one of the most famous verses where Jesus prayed that uh, may the Father be magnified and glorified. He talks about his disciples. But he talks about the importance of the Father being magnified and glorified. When we read those verses <coughs> earlier concerning Jesus in Gethsemane, what did he pray? Not my will but thy will be done. Are we any higher than the Son of God? And if he prayed, Father, not my will be done, if he had to humble himself to take on the cross, how much more are we? The Bible states that God had to humble himself just to live in heaven. <coughs> Yet, the Son of God came down to earth and humbled himself and wrapped himself in humanity. And if God humbled himself, how much more must we humble ourselves? God, not my will, but thy will be done. Too many times we live day to day for ourselves and not for God. If we think about it and step back a little bit, when was the last time we stopped or paused throughout the day and said, God, if there's something you want me to do today, reveal it to me that I may do it. <coughs> you know, we need to learn that we need to humble ourselves before God. We are His hands extended. We need to become more kingdom-minded. What do I mean by that? We need to be consult more self concerned with souls than ever before. We talk and preach about how time is short. How Jesus Christ is coming back at any moment. And we rejoice over the fact that we're ready for heaven. But have we humbled ourselves to the point that God, if God wanted to use us to speak to somebody in Walmart or walking down the street, that we'd allow him to? I remember an account years ago that there was a man that God told him one day before he leaves work to go and buy a gallon of milk. And God took him way out of his way back some windy roads, back this and that. And then God told him to go knock on a house 